time to get started. Um, so having spent a good chunk of this fall trying to convince you that quantum mechanics is very interesting and kind of different in many fundamental ways than the usual classical physics uh, that we talk about, the goal of today's lecture is to try to tell you at least one useful output from that, which is this concept of quantum computers as opposed to classical computers. Uh, before I start, I just want to remind everyone that there is, of course, no lecture next week because of Thanksgiving, and also no lecture the week after that because of physics with the Bane. Um, the final lecture will be December 10th, followed by the luncheon. Um, all right, so let's get started. Right, so I, I spent a lot of time, as I said, talking about quantum mechanics, why it's interesting, why it's different, and we want to use that for computers. Um, now, everyone, everyone here probably has in their mind an idea of what a computer is. It's a magical thing. You ask it something, and the internet tells you the answer. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, at a, at a very fundamental level, what is, a, what is a computer? A computer is just some device that can carry out a list of, kind of arithmetic or logical operations automatically. So you give it a set of instructions and a set of inputs, and it pops through those steps for you. Right? So your computer can just be an abacus. And some guy who knows how to use an abacus, and he can add numbers together, or you can have, this is a picture of the, the first real electronic computer, uh, ENIAC, that the government built. And this is a, you know, a smartphone that many people here have in their pockets. Um, so you know, computers have certainly come a long way. Um, so when I say it carries out a sequence of operations, what do I mean by that at a very basic level? A computational operation basically takes some input and gives you a specific output based on that input and whatever the rules of the game are. So for instance, a very simple thing you can ask a computer to do is add two numbers, right? So the input is two different numbers, and the output is their sum, right? So that's, that's a very basic thing we ask computers to do. You can also ask them to multiply, long division, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another thing you can ask computers to do is to do logic calculations, right? So for instance, imagine doing the logic operation AND. So the input is two Booleans, a Boolean variable. That's just, that's just fancy words for some variable that instead of just being, say, a number or an integer, is either yes or no, true or false. Right? So what AND does is it takes two of these Boolean inputs, and it output, its output is true if both of the inputs were true. So true and true equals true. But if one or both is false, then the output is false. Now, modern computers basically, because of the technology we have available, work in binary. I assume people here are at least reasonably familiar with binary. Yeah. Um, right, so, so binary is just using a base 2 system instead of a base 10 system. Uh, it's really easy because when you build a computer out of electronics, you can kind of Imagine you have some circuit, and if at some, if, you know, at some uh, place where you read a voltage in the circuit, there's a high voltage, you can call that one or true, and if there's a low voltage, you call it zero, right? So you, you know, this this is just kind of the way in which computers work. So let me just remind people in here what exactly binary looks like. So if I take the number uh, 1853, uh, what do we know this number is? Well, it's one times a thousand plus 8 times 100, plus 5 times 10, plus 3 times 1. And that's how you add this number up. That's base 10. That's how we usually do things. It's because we have 10 fingers. Um, base 2 is just a little bit more complicated. But this is the same number. You can work out the algebra, and you see that right. So there's a, there's a, a 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc. You notice that here, as I go in this direction, each the, the value that each digit gives me increases by 2. Whereas, of course, in base 10, it increases by a factor of 10. All right. uh, and so th this is kind of the natural language in which it's much, much easier to, to talk about numbers in a computer. So, so the idea is that if I, have a, if I have some piece of information, like, say, a long number, or, say, a sentence, and that sentence is encoded in some way where I can assign to every letter in the alphabet a number, and then I just write all those numbers back to back to back, I can then break that number in base 2. And so kind of any piece of information, I can rewrite in terms, if I have some rule for how I transcribe it, I can rewrite any piece of uh, digital information into just a string of ones and zeros. Yes? Uh, 
I was going to say, so is this base to the way this format and formula is being set? Is this what they use like with your cell phone hard drives? Is that like how they use the hard drives? Going forward? Yeah, I mean, so so in, in either a solid state or an old time platter hard drive, it the information is always literally just a string of ones and zeros, right. and then a different piece of hardware, different pieces of hardware and software know the rules for what that means. So here, I'm saying that this is a number, and so this is the rule for figuring out what that number means to us. But it could be something different, right? I could say that, you know, uh, A is one, and B is two, and C is three. I write that in base two, and so then I would just, you know, if I have a sentence, I just say, what's the number for the first letter, and the second letter, and the third letter? That the, 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 tech, the, the formal way of doing that is something called ASCII. Um, but th that's the idea, it's really any, any piece of information that's kind of discrete, you know, it's a list of letters, it's a list of numbers, can be written in base two. So, so this is how we store information, but if we have a computer, we of course want to be able to do things to that information, right? We want to transform it, and, and that's done by something called gates. So gate is literally just a piece of circuitry that implements some binary function. So for instance, I could ask about, I could tell you about a NOT gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, so let's remind people what these are, because not everyone here is an electrical engineer, I'm going to assume. Um, so a NOT gate does the following, right? It just negates what your input is in that, uh, in that Boolean sense. So a zero, as it goes through this, turns into a one, and a one turns into a zero. It's called a NOT because if I think of this in that true-false language, it takes false to true and true to false. Similarly, there's something called an AND gate that I mentioned previously, right? So these are the rules. You always get a zero unless both inputs are one. So it's an AND in the sense that the answer is only one or true if both of the inputs were true, right? So if one input is true and one input is false, then both one, then, sorry, then both A and B are not both true, so the output is false. Is this idea clear? This, this, this is something you build into, I mean, circuitry is usually not done like this unless you have, you know, a pocket calculator. Um, modern computers are obviously more sophisticated than this, but, you know, we have to take baby steps. Can you state that Sorry. in terms of voltages, high voltages? Oh, sure, sure. So, so the, the language is always the zero is a low voltage and a one is a high voltage. Yeah, but if you add A and B there and give a couple of those examples. So this isn't, so there's some complicated circuitry in here such that in this case, if I apply a high voltage to both of these leads, I will measure a high voltage here. But if I have a high and low, or a low and high, or a low and low, I will measure a low voltage here. So it's not just a simple wire connecting the two. That clearly wouldn't work. So the, the, the details of this are something that you can read about in any kind of introductory circuitry textbook, but it's, you know, it's, well, it's interesting if you're interested in the details of circuitry, but for what we're interested in, we just, we're happy to believe that you can easily build these things and they work very nicely. So let me go through a couple other examples. So an OR gate gives me true if either A or B is true. So clearly, if both A and B are false, then A or B is false. But if either one of them is true, then I get true. So that as long as there's one one here, I get a one over here. There's also a slightly funnier gate called XOR which stands for exclusive OR, which only gives me a true if one of the two inputs is true. But if they're both true, it gives me false. So the idea here is that I only get true here if only one of the two inputs, but not both, are true. And there's one slightly stranger uh, gate that's going to become very important when we talk about quantum computers, so I'm just gonna tell you about it now. And it's called a C not gate, which just means it's a controlled not gate. So remember, a not gate takes true to false and false to true. And this is a little bit more subtle, but a controlled not gate says that there are two inputs. There's a control parameter A, and then an input parameter B. And if A is true, or one, then A always just carries on through. If A is one, then B gets negated, so true goes to false and false goes to true. If A is zero or false, then I don't do anything to B. So right, the idea is that 
This first row, this, this first column is the A value, the second column is the B value, and then this first column is P, and the second is Q. So you'll notice that A always goes to P. Nothing ever changes, it's just a straight wire through. But when I look at what happens to B, B doesn't change if A is 0, and B does change if A is 1. So this is just a little bit more of a subtle circuit. It's taking two inputs in and spitting two inputs out. All right. So we, we, we talked about kind of the, the basic things that a computer can do. So let's talk about one of them, like adding numbers. So let's remind ourselves how uh, binary addition works. It works exactly like normal addition, except you write numbers in binary. So what do I do? OK, we always sum things from right to left, remembering to carry. So I start with 1 plus 0, that's 1. And there's no carry. And then I say no carry, and 1 plus 1 is 0, but I have to carry the 1. And then I add 1 plus 1 plus 0, which is 0 carrying a 1. And then I have two more zeros, and I have 1 again. All right. So this is, again, literally just the same way you add numbers, except we're working in a base 2 instead of base 10. So each digit can only be a 0 or a 1. So let's just think about this part of the calculation here. If I don't have to worry about a, a, an incoming carry coming through, how does this work? Right? You, you can write down something called a truth table, which basically just says, what are the rules to make sure I'm doing addition correctly? Right? So if I'm adding 0 and 0, there's some is 0 and there's nothing to carry. If I'm adding 0 and 1, or 1 and 0, the sum is 1, and again, there's nothing to carry. But if I add 1 and 1, then the sum is 0, but there is a number to carry. Right? So if you could implement a circuit that basically takes these two inputs, whatever they are, and gives these two outputs, we can easily build a calculator. And this is, you, you can kind of convince yourself, given the rules that I told you about, that this is, in fact, exactly the circuit. This is an exclusive OR gate. This is an AND gate. This circuit will give you these sets of rules all right, so that we can do our addition. Now, this isn't really all we need. We need to, of course, have an input that's carrying from the previous line. So then you have to do things a little bit more carefully. I have to add both A and B digits and the carry-in from the previous step of the calculation. And so I'm just going to add up these first three numbers and get a sum and a carry. And you can see the rules are reasonably straightforward. If all I have, is, if the total is 1, 1, 1, then the sum was always 1, and there's nothing to carry. If I have two ones in any line, then the sum is 0 and the carry is 0. And if I happen to have all three ones, then the sum is 3, which in binary is 1, 1. So the sum is 1, and I have to carry a 1. And again, it's a slightly uglier uh, circuit array, but you can again convince yourself, given the rules I've told you, if you just set, ask, sit down and ask for all of these inputs, are these the outputs I get? And this is indeed the circuit you get, where these are exclusive OR gates, AND gates, and a regular OR gate. So let's imagine just taking this and kind of concatenating this into just one piece, you know, one slightly more complicated piece of circuitry. Where again, the three inputs are the A and B digits and a carry in, and the outputs are their sum and their carry out. All right? And then I just have to wire a bunch of these together to do the addition I'm interested in. All right? So, what do I do? Uh, here I'm just going through the example of adding these things. So, of course, in the first digit, the, the, the most rightmost one, there's nothing to carry in, so I always just put a zero here. I sum the two, I get a sum and a carry out. In this case, the carry out is zero. I sum these three, I get a sum of zero and a carry out of one. I sum these three, I get a sum of zero and a carry out of one. I sum these three, I get a sum of one and a carry out of zero. And this is, is, is literally how you can, in your garage, build a computer. Right? I mean, if you just want to add numbers, this is something that's reasonably simple to build. Um, this isn't, of course, a very useful computer because you have a bunch of wires here, so you need to come up with a little bit more circuitry so that when I say have a 1 here, I would say turn on a light bulb, and when there's a 0, I don't turn on a light bulb, and have easy ways of addressing these inputs. <coughs> but kind of schematically, this is the basic idea, right? You start with these 
kind of small building blocks of basic logic gates. And from them, you can build kind of more and more complicated pieces of computer technology to do whatever computation you want. Now here, I mean here, I am basically doing a one-step calculation. I'm just adding two numbers. If I say I wanted to add up a whole bunch of different numbers, I'd have to line up, you know, I'd have to do some two of them and then take that output and sum it to another one, so on and so forth. So th th this is really, at, at a kind of a, at a conceptual level, what underlies basically every computer you've probably ever played with in your life, right? You, you have ones and zeros, and you come up with rules for I take a bunch of ones and zeros as inputs, and I spit out a bunch of ones and zeros. And then maybe you have a monitor, and the monitor knows that certain strings of ones and zeros are certain colors, and that's how you can get a picture on your computer. But a fundamental assumption that, I, that, that we assumed when describing all of this was the following. What we assumed was that these bits, right, the bit, the smallest piece of information, a true or false statement, a one or a zero, a bit is either one or zero, right? And that's a very classical concept, right? If I really have a, a, a macroscopic wire with some voltage applied to it, that voltage is either high or low. I mean, you can imagine that there's really technically some intermediate range, but for the purposes that we're interested in, there's really kind of high voltage or low voltage. You can think of it like a light switch, right? The light switch is either switched on or off. Or you have a box, or you have a set of boxes, and you're allowed to put marbles in each box, right? There's either a marble in a box or there's not, or it's not a marble in a box, right? That's the sense in which it's really a classical idea. So a, a very natural question once we started thinking about quantum mechanics is, what happens if we allow these infinitesimal bits of information to be quantum mechanical instead of classical? Right. So, as I've discussed in previous lectures, um, a, a, uh, the spin of an electron is, is a basically a matter. Right. Every electron is really, it's of course a charged particle, but it has a magnetic moment, which means that it's like a little magnet. And there is a sense in which you can think of that magnet as being either pointed up or down, right? So if I trap an electron somewhere, but I allow its spin to point in either the up or down direction, I can use that as a bit of information, right? I can say, if it's spinning up, it's one. If it's spinning down, it's zero. Now, this is, of course, very tricky to do experimentally, and experimentally people don't actually do this just with bare electrons. Um, but conceptually, that's good enough for us, right? Someone's popular. Um, so, right, so, so this is the basic idea, is that I'm going to have some quantum object, and I'm going to use that as a quantum bit, or the nomenclature is qubit, because it sounds cuter. Um, so, so this is what a, a bit is, and a fair question is, what's the quantum version of a gate, right? The gates were these ways in which we can transform sets of inputs. Well, using this analogy of electrons and behaving like magnets, because an electron is a magnet, if you put it in an external magnetic field, it will persist. So here's basically the picture here. Mu is the kind of magnetic orientation of the electron. B is an applied magnetic field. And if I, if I have this electron and it's not allowed to move, what will happen is the, the orientation or the spin of the electron, the direction in which its magnet is pointing, will persist around the magnetic field at the cyclotron frequency, which is a, a frequency we discussed previously. It's something that's known very well. Um, so this gives us a way of taking a quantum bit as input and changing it as output, right? I can say, if I have my bit pointing in this direction and I turn on the magnetic field for a set amount of time, I know what output I get. So. This is how we build quantum gates. We take our set of electrons and we do things to them. We apply external magnetic fields or external electric fields or something else. Right? So a very reasonable question is, what types of classical gates can be quantum? Right? It's not obvious that everything can be done in that same way. Right? Because the rules are we, we don't want to disturb the electron by measuring it. We only want to act on it with, say, magnetic field and let it evolve on its own. Right? And what that means is that quantum gates have to be reversible, right? So 
Why do they have to be reversible? The idea is the following. Okay, I take my electron, I apply a magnetic field, I allow it to process for a little bit, and I get some output. Well, it's clear from that description that I could run that process in reverse, right? Because if I apply the magnetic field in the opposite direction, it will process in the opposite way. And so if I can rotate a spin, I can unrotate it, right? So if you have a quantum gate, a reverse gate has to exist. And basically what that means is that you have to have the same number of inputs as you have outputs. Because you don't want to throw away electrons, right? If you throw away electrons and they were entangled with the electrons you're keeping track of, you're, you're, you're decohering the system and you're throwing away information. And that's just not something we want to do. So what does that mean, right? If you have to have the same number of inputs as outputs, obviously we can't have an AND or an OR or an XOR gate because I have two inputs and one output. So these aren't interesting from a quantum computing perspective. However, something that's pretty easy to do is to construct a quantum NOT gate. Now remember, we said that spin up was a 1, spin down was a 0. So let's apply, for instance, a magnetic field orthogonal to the spin's orientation and allow it to process half a rotation, right? So that means is that up will rotate to down, down will rotate to up, and this is exactly what we wanted, right? This is a NOT gate. A 1 goes to a 0, and a 0 goes to a 1. So in a very physical way, we've, we've been able to build the kind of simplest circuit available to us. Yeah? Is the spin up and spin down alternative something that gets translated into the high and low voltage that you talked about earlier, or is this an alternative to that? It's, a, it's, a, it's an alternative. And and, and the honest truth is it's kind of it's a conceptual alternative, right? Because an electron spin orientation is the simplest quantum mechanical model we can construct. Because it's 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 kind of very there's only one degree of freedom, which is the direction the spin is pointing. So, you know, I don't I'm not I'm not worried about the electron moving somewhere. I'm assuming that I have it trapped very well in some location. And so this is really different than the voltage, right? Because a voltage is a really a, a circuit voltage is really a classical effect. Now, I'll discuss this later, when people actually try to build quantum computers with some number of bits, they don't actually do it with, with, with bare, you know, trapped electrons manipulating their spins, they do it with more complicated <coughs> things. But the physics at the end of the day is basically the same. You, you, have, you have some object that can be pointing, say, in two orthogonal directions. This is, a, this is something that I've discussed previously, but I want to remind everyone here. The funny thing about uh, electron spin is that even though pictorially it looks like up and down aren't orthogonal, right? They just have opposite directions. For, for electrons, they're really orthogonal states in the sense that they have no overlap, right? If I say uh, I, have, I have one spin pointing up, I have another spin pointing down, they can be in the same place at the same time and still satisfy Pauli exclusion. Um, I'll, I'll discuss this a little bit more later. Um, so, so, so this is ba the, the basic idea, is that a, a simple gate is I take 1 to 0 and 0 to 1, which I imagine is basically being I rotate the spin by 180 degrees. Okay, that's a quick question. Yeah. Yes. That's true. That's true, yes. So, so, so when, I, when I talk about spin, it's a shorthand for saying that an electron isn't kind of a, a large ball that's rotating. Uh, it's a quantum object that has some amount of angular momentum. Now, if I have a ball and I'm spinning it, it, of course, has some angular momentum, but it has some huge amount of angular momentum. An electron has basically the smallest amount of angular momentum a particle can have. Because it's not a because it's not a classical object, basically. It's you, you, the, there's a sense in which you can sort of think of it as spinning from this point of view, in the sense that you know, uh, if I had a charged object that was spinning and I put it in a magnetic field, it would process as well. But that's really just kind of a classical analogy. The spin of an electron is really an intrinsic quantum feature. You can visualize it by saying that it's like a ball that's rotating, but that doesn't actually give you the right answer. 
but it, it can be useful as kind of a pictorial intuition. Right? That's why I draw these arrows. Right? The, the direction of the spin is the axis of rotation. But that's just talking about one bit of information at a time, and that's not very useful. So uh, I, I have to introduce kind of some sort of convention to be able to talk about multiple quantum bits at the same time. So if I say I have three bits, and I have the first one is a zero, and the second one is a zero, and the third one is a zero, I'm just going to write that as shorthand as zero, zero, 001. But remember that in quantum systems, you are allowed to have particles in quantum linear superpositions. right? They don't have to be in a fixed state. So here, I can imagine that my first electron is in a superposition of being a 0 and a 1. And my second electron is definitely a 0. And I can expand this out just using the product rule. And that would tell me that it's you know, a times 0, 0 plus b times 1, 0. So this is just kind of a shorthand notation. The idea is that if I have n bits, a reasonable basis to talk about them is just writing out all binary numbers at that length. So using that convention, I mentioned previously the CNOT gate. And a CNOT gate is also something, right? It has two inputs and two outputs. You can convince yourself that it's actually reversible, because if I put two of them back to back, I always get the same output. So a quantum controlled NOT gate is, is, a, is an allowed quantum gate, and the rules are basically the exact same rules as I wrote previously, except instead of these being classical input bits and classical output bits, I'm writing it as a quantum as a transformation rule for quantum states. Now, the, the way in which you, you'd actually do this in terms of applying electric magnetic fields is significantly more subtle, and I don't want to get into the details of it, but the punchline is that it's something that you can build, it's something that people actually do build when they actually build quantum computers. That's a very important gate, as we'll see uh, shortly. Now, why are quantum computers so much more powerful than classical computers? This is probably something that everyone here has been told at one point or another in their life. right? And the, the reason is the following. right? If I just have some classical set of bits, if you want to know what state they're in, you just have to know the value of each bit. right? That's not that much information. But quantum states can be in superpositions of those different classical values, right? It doesn't have to be 0, 0, or 1, 0. It can be 1 half, 1, 0, plus 1 half, 0, 1, as, as some nice entangled state, right? So there are many, many more possible states that a quantum string of bits can be in than classical bits. And that additional room, that additional space, that configuration space that quantum strings of bits can be in is going to be extremely powerful. Um, the reason it's going to be extremely powerful is by being able to construct uh, entangled states. So recall that we can create entangled pairs of electrons, right? So here I have a set of two electrons that are, say, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Why is this entangled? Well, if it was just 0, 0, then the point is that you can measure the spin of one particle, and it doesn't change what you will measure in the second particle. But here, if it's 0, 0, plus 1, 1, and I say, measure the first particle, then that uniquely fixes what the next particle has to be measured as, right? In some probabilistic manner. So here, there's a 50% chance that I'll measure one electron as, as down and one or as up. But once I do that measurement, the remaining electron will be 100% of the time found in the corresponding state, all right? And so, you know, these types of entangled states are very useful. Uh, can, we, can we use a quantum computer to construct entangled pairs? Before I get into that, I, I want to make a brief aside and, and discuss something that has been asked occasionally and that I've mentioned in passing, uh, which is this question about when I have pairs of entangled particles, can I or can I not send information using that entanglement? Um, this was originally discussed in a, in a paper by uh, uh, Einstein, Rosen, and I think, the EPR paradox that you may have heard about. Um, so the idea is the following, right? You create a pair of entangled electrons, right? So the idea is that if I measure spin up here, then I measure the spin here, it has to be spin up. But if I measure spin down here, and then I measure the spin here, it has to be spin down. Can I send a signal using this entanglement? Right? Does it matter which one we measure first? 
And the answer is no, right? So I take this picture, and I do a relativistic boost to the right. And when I do a relativistic boost to the right, I see that I measured this particle before I measured this particle, right? That's just, this is just one of the rules of uh, Lorentz transformations. But if I did a boost to the left, I would have measured the left particle before the right particle. So what does that mean? There's no sense in which we can talk about which particle was observed first. Right? I can change to a different reference frame such that one particle is measured ahead of the other. And if there's no way of saying which one was measured first, then there's no way in which you could talk about using this to send information, right? Because is this guy sending information to this guy, or is this guy sending information to this guy, right? That's, that's a question that doesn't actually make any sense, right? Because it depends on who's, who's watching and how they're watching. The rule is just that no matter in what frame you're looking at, who it looks like measure the spin first, they have to measure the same spin. That's the only rule. And because of this fact that you can't determine which one was measured first, there's no way in which you could use this to send information faster than the speed of light. Is that clear? <laughs> the, 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 if, you, if it's a little confusing, just take the, take the, the important punchline is that you cannot use these entangled pairs to transmit information. Right? There's intrinsic information already built into them, but I can't use that to send signals. Now, when we're talking about quantum bits instead of classical bits, there are certain types of circuits that you could build that you could not build in a classical way. Right? For instance, what if I didn't do a 180 degree rotation? What if I did a 90 degree rotation? Right? If I do a 90 degree rotation, up goes to right and down goes to left. Right? But if you remember the rules for electrons, the point is that left is equal to up plus down and right is equal to up minus down. And these funny rules tell me that these left and right are also orthogonal in the way that up and down are orthogonal. Right? And, and it's clear that I could never do this with classical information, right? I can't send, right? A rule like this doesn't make any sense in a classical computer, but in a quantum computer, it's perfectly allowed, right? So this is a very uh, famous piece of, of quantum circuitry called a Hadamard gate. So the idea is that it takes a zero state into the linear superposition of 0 plus 1, and it takes the 1 state into the superposition 0 minus 1. And again, there's no classical analog to this type of quantum gate. It's, it's really intrinsically quantum. But it's very important, because if I take a Hadamard gate, and I stick it on the control line next to a control not gate, I can do the following, right? I say my input here is just 0, 0, a trivial non-entangled state, right? And then the Hadamard gate rotates the first electron so that I get 0 plus 1 times 0, which is 0, 0 plus 1, 0. This is, again, not entangled, right? The first particle has a 50% chance of being a 1 or 0, but neither, regardless of whichever I measure, the second particle is always going to be a 0, right? So even though this is in a superposition, it's not entangled in the sense of measuring one changes what I have to measure about the other. However, if you remember the rules for what the control not gate does, the rules are written up here, and I, and I grind through what this gives me, I end up seeing that, well, 0, 0 goes to 0, 0, but 1, 0 goes to 1, 1. So at the end of the day, I took an unentangled state, and I took it to 0, 0 plus 1, 1 which is our canonical example of an entangled state. So it's not just an issue of you know, hoping to create pairs of electrons that happen to be in entangled situations. You can actually build a physical circuit that will take two qubits and will entangle them. And that's really, really important. So why is that really important? Are there any questions about this? Yeah. So th this isn't an issue of communication. This is just the fact that I'm allowed to do a 90 degree rotation, right? You know, here I'm just picking nice 
angles to make my life easier. I can do a rotation by whatever angle I want. This is just a particularly nice one because it gives me equal probability between 0 and 1 with an explicit phase that is either plus 1 or minus 1. Um, and, and maybe if you can, from a field of one of those. If, if, if quantum communication is not possible, what do the results is? That's what I'm going to get to. So, so, so of course, right, we, we know because of things like special relativity, you can't send information faster than the speed of light. That's not the goal here. Right? The goal is to just do calculations faster. Um, so how are we going to do calculations faster? Right? So why do people use huge supercomputing clusters instead of just their laptop to do very difficult calculations? Right? And the, the idea is the following. This idea of parallelizing a calculation. So say you have some, you know, some set of gates, some calculation you want to do, but you don't want to just do that calculation with one fixed input, right? Say you want to do it with basically all possible inputs to look at the landscape of outputs. In a classic computer, how do you do that? You just have to do the calculation for your first input, and then do the calculation for your second input, and the third input, and so on and so forth. And it takes a very long time. And the, the larger your set of inputs, the longer it takes. And classically, the only way to speed that up is to basically have more than one computer running the code at once, right? And so most people's cell phones are, are like this. Most people's laptops are like this. They are multi-core computers. The idea is that you have your computer, and it says, here's core one. You run it for the first, you know, let's say I have, I want to evaluate some function for 40 different inputs, right? So I can either have one CPU go through each of those 40 steps, or I can say, have my first core do the first 10, the second 10, the third 10, and the last 10, right? And that'll tell me that since I've divided it by four, it will take one quarter as long to do the calculation, right? And this is why huge supercomputing cluster centers are really important, because if you have access to you know, hundreds or thousands of cores, then you can save yourself a huge amount of time. But it's costly, right? It's, you know, you, you have to have all of these different computers running at the same time. It costs more energy. Uh, you, know, you save yourself time by basically paying more money. So that's classical parallelizing. Quantum parallelizing is much, much nicer. So how does that work, right? Since we have the power of constructing states that are super, superpositions of different classical states, we're going to do the following. I'm going to start with a simple state. So let's, let's think about three bits. I'll start with 0, 0, 0. Now, if I stand each bit through a Hadamard gate, the output is going to be a perfect superposition of all possible inputs. So what does this look like? Right? You just follow the rules that we talked about. If I act the Hadamard gate on each of these qubits, I get 0 plus 1 times 0 plus 1 times 0 plus 1. And you expand this out on all of its ugly glory, and you literally just get a list of all possible three-digit binary numbers. And so if I take this and run it through one quantum circuit, the output will be the output for each one of these classical qubit inputs. Right? So I don't have to run it. Uh, I don't have to run it six times. I just have to run it once. Right? So th this, this idea of uh, quantum parallelizing is one of the reasons that things can run much faster on quantum computers than classical computers. Um, yeah, of course. To calculate how many states uh, two qubits could carry, three qubits, is there like n to the sum of power equal to number? It's, so it's, it's, it's true to the n. So, the, the, so the question is basically kind of what's the dimensionality of a of the space of possible assignments for quantum strings of bits. So first of all, if I had a set of classical bits, let's say I have n bits, then the dimensionality of the space for that is 2 times n, right? So 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. However, for quantum bits, because of the idea that you can linearly superpose them, it grows much faster. It goes 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, etc. Right? It has this exponential growth. It grows as 2 to the n. So when I do examples with one bit or two bits, you don't immediately see that, right? Because two squared is the same as two times two. But as soon as I get to three or more, you immediately see that there's much more room 
uh, in, in quantum bits than classical bits. Yeah? I guess there's one missing, there should be eight up there, right? There's only, I don't <coughs> Yes, what did I forget? One, two, three. Ah, good, thank you, yes. Yeah, there, there of course should be one, one, zero in here as well. Okay. Yeah. That's a little crazy though. Um, so, mu to the power, well, let's say 300, with 2 to the power 300. Yeah. On one level, I know that's more than all the particles in the universe, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. I can believe that, yeah. But it, these are huge. No. So the actual state of the art of quantum computers is not 300 qubits. It's maybe 10 qubits. It's still a big number. Um, but the, you know, there are lots of problems that I'll, I'll discuss in a little bit, right? So we're not at the level where we actually have classical or quantum analogs of a computer where you have you know a 64-bit registry or anything like that. But it's you know we'll get there at some point. It's a, it's a really at, at, at this point, it's a very difficult engineering problem, okay. not a physics problem. Question. Yeah. Going back to the slide before, okay, so you got all your combination, you're adding them, and then there was a carry to that if you, you did all that, right? So yes, yeah, so, so, so here, I'm not telling you what I'm going to do with this, right? So this could be, say I want to think about adding all possible uh, three-digit binary numbers to each other. Then yeah, I mean I I'd have to tell you what I'm actually going to do with this. I haven't specified that in detail. Um, yeah. What's the significance of all of those plus signs being plus signs? So if if some of them were minus, what would that mean? If some of these were minuses, then some of these were would be minuses. It, you know, it's uh, so 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 if one of these so if say this middle guy had been a one, then this would have had a minus sign, and then there would be relative minus signs between these guys. And so if you play with things like that, you could try to construct some sort of clever uh, interferometry between the different states. Um, he, here, I'm just, I'm just trying to show you that one state can cover all possible classical inputs at the same time. What we do with that is, of course, a much harder problem. But, but before I get to that, I, I want to, I wanna, again, make, make a comment. So after you take whatever your input state is and you grind it through your quantum circuits, you get an output that's a superposition of kind of all of the different outputs, right? And you have to remember that measurements are probabilistic, right? So if I just have a linear combination of all possible outputs and I do a measurement, I'm just going to get one of my multiple answers, right? So we have to be much more clever than that, right? We need to use the fact that measurement is probabilistic to our advantage. And how do you do that? You say you don't just do a calculation. You have to do a calculation in a clever way, right? So the idea being that, so for instance, the classical, sorry, a classic, not classical, a classic problem in computing is factoring numbers. I'll discuss this a little bit later. And so how do you, and, and so, you know, I need to say, I wanted to try to factor these numbers, and I get some quantum output, but then I have to start measuring the bits to see what my answer is. How do I make sure that the measurement I do gives me an answer that I care about? not an answer that I don't care about. I'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, so, so when you construct a quantum algorithm, it's not just a set of sets. It's a set of sets that aims to maximize the probability that the state you measure at the end of the day is a state you care about. Right? And so pictorially, the idea is the following. Right? So this is just, say, a, a, a list of a whole bunch of different possible states. And they all basically have equal probability. But if I grind through some clever quantum algorithm, I'll find that the probability is, is peaked at a bunch of discrete locations. So that if I do a measurement, I'll measure a value that should be basically hitting on the nose one of these points. This is, this is a picture related to, to, to factorization. Uh, that I'll discuss in a little bit. The, the idea is basically the, the, the following, right? I start with something that looks like I have equal probability on all outputs, and I have to act on that quantum system in a clever way so that it kind of piles up on only answers I am interested in. Otherwise, this is all useless, right? So this is my output, and I do a measurement. It's just random. Here, it's clearly not random. There are basically you know, five interesting answers. Okay. So 
Let's talk about number factorization, right? How do you factor a number, right? You guess, right? And that's literally what you do. You have some number, you say, how do I factor it? Well, if the last number is even, you know that you can divide it by two, and you keep doing that until the last number is even, and then you just have to sit down and start guessing, right? So what do you do? You start with pairs of numbers, you multiply them, you see if the answer you got was the answers you're interested in, and if not, you try again, and you repeat this over and over again, right? And this is this is uh, this takes an exponentially long amount of time, exponential in the number of digits of the number, right? And because this takes this prohibitively long amount of time, this is the reason that modern day cryptography works, right? Modern day cryptography works in the following way, right? You need to be able to encode things, lock them, and decode things, unlock them. And the idea is the following. There's a very clever algorithm that works in the following way. If I know a large number, I can encode anything in such a way that if I just know the large number, I can't also decode it. But if I know how that large number factors, then I know the rules for how to decrypt it or unlock it. Right? So it's a very type of special type of locked box. So this is what a public and private key is in, in modern day cryptography. Right? The public key is that large number that you send out to anyone who wants to send you something privately. But once they encode it, only you can decode it because only you know how it factorizes. Now the details of the math of how that works is kind of complicated, but that's essentially the ingredient. So the danger is that you put your large number out there if someone else can factorize it, they can unlock anything that you can unlock, right? So that's why you know modern day encryption uses you know 192 bits numbers as your unlocking tools because the, how much computer time would cost to factorize that is just ridiculously, ridiculously long. Uh, unless presumably you're the, you're the NSA and then you can just spend all the money you want on it. <laughs> For, 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 for most of it's fine. You know, this, this is why you can buy things on the internet. Um, so so that, that exponential time is important. However, in 1994, a mathematician by the name of Peter Shore came up with a much, much faster way of factoring numbers. Right? And the way that works is that it, it, it's based uh, very explicitly on using a quantum computer instead of a classical computer. And essentially, the idea is that since it's a quantum computer, instead of having to go through the list of multiplying all numbers times each other one by one, going it through step by step, you do it in a linear superposition, so you multiply all possible numbers together at the same time. And then you have to have some clever way of changing that state so that you maximize probabilities on the answers that gave you the number you wanted. And, and, and the speed is much, much faster. It's polynomial in the length instead of exponential in the length. Which means that you know, it's it's you don't have to wait for the heat death of the universe. Um, however, of, of course, the measurement is probabilistic, so you won't always get the answer on the first try. But you can prove mathematically that it's very very likely that you will get the answer after a few number of steps, right? So what could go wrong, right? So let's say we're trying to factor the number twelve hundred seventy three. Well, the algorithm could, for instance, tell you that it factorizes as one times twelve hundred seventy three instead of nineteen. Uh, times 67, right? But if I run it again, eventually I should hit this on the head. Right? It is technically probabilistic, so if you were very, very unlucky, it, it could take you a large number of steps, um, but you should eventually hit it. Um, and this has actually been done, right? So this is a, this is a paper by a group at an IBM research uh, station from 2001. So what did they do? They factored the number 15 uh, using, I think, seven qubits. Right, using essentially this algorithm I discussed, right, and then uh, in in 2012, uh, uh, British uh, physicists factored uh, 143, and more recently, people factorized a five-digit number, right. So as I said, modern cryptography is based on 192-digit numbers, and we're at the moment nowhere near being able to build quantum computers that can take that many bits as input and stay really properly quantum and not decohere. But it's going to happen eventually. 
Um, which maybe makes you worry, right? You think, well, okay, if this is going to happen eventually, what's going to happen to, uh, to you know, modern encryption methods? And the answer is people already actually sorted that out. Because just as you can use quantum mechanics to factor large numbers, you can also use quantum mechanics to come up with much better ways of encrypting things. Right? And, and, and the, the, the key idea is that measuring a, a quantum state can change the state, right? If it was in a linear superposition of up and down, and I measure the spin and I see that it's up, then it's just up, right? So you've changed the state. And what that means is that, say, Alice and Bob are communicating using both, say, classical and quantum channels, and someone is trying, perhaps, to eavesdrop, right? Well, if, if Alice sends a quantum signal to Bob, and Eve measures it, then unless she got very lucky, lucky, she measured it in such a way that changed it. And if she measures it in such a way that changed it, then that gives a noticeable effect to Bob. So the, the, the basic idea, and this is kind of the most basic way of doing quantum encryption, is the following. Alice uh, will send a bunch of spins to Bob, and she will either have them polarized left, right, or up, down, at random. And Bob will measure them up, down, or left, right, at random. And so if no one is listening in, then basically they will agree 50% of the time. However, if someone is listening in and, and then occasionally changing them, they won't agree 50% of the time. They'll agree more like 25% of the time. And they can talk to each other and notice that. So they, they use this quantum channel to set up a set of rules for how to encrypt things, but they, know, they can immediately know if someone is listening in. And if someone is listening in, they know that they need to start over. Um, and th this is just kind of a toy picture, but this can be exploited to construct encryption methods that, you, that are not basically based on factoring large numbers. They are much stronger, and you don't have to worry about a quantum computer breaking them. Um, so, you know, and, 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 and again, just like people have done experiments where they have actually built very small scale quantum computers to factor numbers, People have done experiments demonstrating that this type of quantum encryption really does work. It's usually done uh, not with, not of course with electric spins, it's usually done with photon polarization, either just with lasers shooting through the air or with uh, fiber optics. Okay, so, so something that we, that, that, that we of course have to mention, I, I mentioned briefly in the beginning, is this issue of stability, right? So we have all of these toy models of an electron, and its spin is either direct spinning spin up or spin zero, and it's kind of trapped in place in perfect vacuum. And that's, of course, not something you can really build in a lab, right? It's very, very difficult. It's basically impossible to perfectly isolate electrons, and it's very, very difficult to even isolate them really well. So any, any uh, quantum computation based on just something as simple as electron spin is unstable to something called decoherence, which is basically, I want it to have my two electrons, and they're just entangled with each other and not entangled with anything else, but there's some external environment, and that external environment can you know, affect them in such a way that they no longer are strongly entangled with each other. And if they're no longer strongly entangled with each other, you can't use that the way of constructing highly entangled states to do this quantum parallelism, and so your quantum computer won't really work. Um, so you have, to, you have to worry about this noise from the outside if it just have bare electrons. So what you really need is you need states that are very robustly stable, right? An electron spin is not stable. If I hit it with the photon, it changes, right? So that's, that's kind of very weak. You need uh, something like a topological state of matter that has topological defects because those topological defects, by their very nature, are extremely stable. So uh, those of you who were here last week, remember I discussed quasi-holes in fractional quantum Hall plateaus, right? These are these very funny topological excitations of, uh, of semiconductors and strong magnetic fields. They carry fractional amounts of charge. And they're very highly entangled with each other. And that entanglement is kind of built in. You, you can't decohere to uh, quasi holes from each other. And so the, the idea is very roughly the following. Um, if I have two quasi holes, 
right? So, so here, this is kind of a, you know, this is some picture of some fractional quantum Hall plateau in particular. There's this very funny plateau at five halves. Uh, that's the, the, the state that people actually are interested in using to build a quantum computer. The idea is that, unlike in the, in the electron case, we said each electron was a qubit. Well, it doesn't quite work for quasi-holes. What you do is you say two, a pair of quasi-holes can act as one qubit. And then if I, for instance, braid the quasi-hole, I wind one around the other, that acts as a quantum gate acting on that one qubit. And if I do some more non-trivial braiding, where I take these qubits over here, and I do some funny braiding around another set of qubits, that acts as a quantum gate that acts on multiple bits at once. So if there was a way to kind of pin these topologically protected states down and force them to braid in these particular ways, you could build a significantly more robust quantum computer. So current experimental, so okay, so a couple comments. You can't really build a quantum computer out of the simple quasi-holes I discussed last week in the Laughlin one-third state. They're not, they're, they're topologically non-trivial, but they're not non-trivial enough. Um, what could work is the quasi-particles that are expected to exist in this observed five-half state. It's not entirely clear what exactly is going on in that five-half state, but their conjectures of what's going on in there are, are types of quasi-holes that you could use to really build a quantum computer. Um, this, this, of course, is very difficult, right? Because you have to take this topological object and have some way of manipulating it within your sample to braid it without destroying its non-trivial entanglement with all the other quasi-holes. Um, so, it's it's a it's a difficult problem, but it's you know a, a promising candidate for really robustly stable quantum computing. Uh, current quantum computing, as I said, does, isn't done with kind of single electrons. What it's kind of usually done with, uh, so so as as I said, actually trying to braid and wind these quasi holes around each other is very difficult. But people are doing uh, interesting experimental work trying to come up with ways of manipulating them. Uh, What's currently done is people use what are called superconducting qubits, among the other methods. So a superconducting qubit is not actually a topologically stable qubit in the way that a quasi-hole could be, right? Um, but since it's in a superconducting state, and it, so it's super, it's very, very non-dissipative. And so it's much less, it, it, it takes a little bit longer for the whole system to decohere. Now, it doesn't take an arbitrarily long amount of time for the system to decohere. In the best cases, I think the decoherence time scale is something like 100 microseconds, right? So that's not very long, right? That's not going to be useful for a computer. So what do you actually do, right? You, do, you, you, you know, set up a computer to try to do everything all at once, and then you measure the output as quickly as you can before the system falls apart. Um, now, people are working on ways of increasing this number. Uh, it's not clear whether or not you can really make it arbitrarily long, um, but because of these issues, it's, it's clear that a quantum computer is never going to be the type of thing that you just leave on your desk running there forever, right? It has to be something that's at super, super cold temperatures, and you can't, you know, you can't even tap it or it'll decohere um, for now. Uh, but if you were able to come up with a topologically robust right, uh, a set of qubits in the way that quasi-holes and fractional quantum Hall states are really robust to perturbations, then you could imagine building a computer that's much more stable and can run for a longer amount of time. Um, and that's you know, one very active direction of research. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, with, with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, and and I, I'll, I'll just briefly mention what I'm going to talk about uh, in the last lecture is going to be kind of a little bit of an extension of this and what I've talked about previously. I'm going to try to give you a flavor of not just the work that I'm doing kind of in, in modern uh, theoretical physics research, but kind of what the, the field of condensed matter more broadly is looking at, uh, in, 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 at least in, in, in things related to these kind of topologically protected states. Thank you.
Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So, so I mean, you can. There are you know there are lots of logic gates. Right. You know, so I remember gate, doing gate. a program where it was a true and false statement where um, it had a few flaws with like, can I fit three people inside a four bus stay? And I said, no, it came up false. So put three in there and it came up false. Yeah. So, so, so I mean, can that's, you, that's, can you repeat that's, the question, please? The, the, the question, if, if I understand correctly, was, so how, is, how are these statements about circuitry related to kind of the usual things that are discussed in kind of a standard computer science uh, class. So in a standard computer science class, you would probably never never get to the issue of, of quantum gates. You know, you, you would you would point out that if I can build a whole bunch of basic logic gates using some circuitry, I can use those basic logic gates to build. So th there's a there's a sense in which a with a fixed and finite number of building blocks of logic gates. There are mathematical proofs that tell you that I can build basically any function I want out of those Legos, right? Um, and and I, I think if I, I want to say that you don't even need all three of these because you can, for instance, build an XOR of ands and ors and nots. Um, so, so, so even at the level of classical computing, there's a sense in which you, you start with enough building blocks and you can build any kind of quantum circuit you want, you can do any calculation you want. And there is a similar statement in quantum computing. Of course, it's different, right? Because as I said, these types of gates aren't allowed in quantum computing. And the rules of quantum computing are a little different, because at the end of the day, you don't have input to output. You have basically every input to trying to probabilistically pick out answers you're interested in. But there, there is absolutely a, a field of, kind of quantum computer science interested in understanding how well we can do these things. Um, but you know, in many ways, it starts looking very different, most strongly because of the fact that what you're always asking for at the end of the day isn't the fastest way to calculate this. It's the fastest way to give me, at highest probability possible, the answer, answer that I need to have. Oh. Yeah? In the Pauline algebra, a million years ago, they had a more gate. I noticed you didn't use that. Is that an XOR gate? No, so yeah, so if I go back to those gates, yeah, so so uh, a, a NOR gate is just an OR gate, and then I put a NOT at the end here, right? So it literally, it would just negate all of these guys, right? So it would be 1, 0, 0, 0, which is different from an XOR, right? Because XOR is 0, 1, 1, 0. Yeah. yeah. I got two questions. First one is. Not my work, uh, but there, there absolutely is. Uh, it, they, they are more interested in funding the experimental side of these things, but definitely the Defense Department, DARPA, uh, DOE, these agencies are very interested, and for obvious reasons, of having functional quantum computers. The second question has to do with decoherence. Yes. I'm not so sure I can appreciate how it relates to this quantum computing, but I'm trying to get more fundamental concept. So etymologically, it seems like a concept that says that something that was in phase with something else goes out of phase. Uh, and yeah. I, I'm wondering if pictorially you could help me understand what that means by illustrating it with a measurement correlated to the strict coherence. In, in the two-slit experiment, when you have one photon going through at once, you got the waves going through pictorially the, the, the general, the, 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 the uh, classical picture, and then all of a sudden, instead of the waves, you get a dot on the screen. Where is decoherence there? What's going out of phase with what? So, so it, from from the point of view of something like the double slit experiment. So, so when I talk about de decoherence, what I what I really mean is decoherence because of the external environment. Because if I really had my system perfectly at zero temperature, perfectly isolated from everything else, it'll happily stay the way it is forever. So you can imagine, for instance, the double slit experiment, except I don't just have these two slits. I maybe have slightly translucent regions where light's coming in from other ways. And that will non-trivially interfere with what was supposed to be a very nice pattern and mess up my nice uh, interfer interferometry. So, so it, it's basically something that says, it, I want it to, in the double slit, right? I have my two waves in, and they have this beautiful interference pattern with each other. 
But if I also have some other wave coming in from somewhere else, it will interfere with those waves as well and mess up their night path. And if that external wave kind of comes in in a random way, because it's a random thermal noise, then it'll just wash out the nice interference pattern you would have previously. So when you run the two slit experiment, the actual uh, result of any single photon is it, it, where it goes, where, where it lights up the screen is a result of it having been interfered with by some other light source, some other? No, so, so in, the, in the perfect double slit experiment, the point is that the photon goes through both slits at once and interferes with itself, right? And that's how you get a pattern. Now, if I didn't have a very well sealed off box, then what would happen is the photon goes in through the double slits, interferes with itself, but there's also light leaking in from somewhere else. And that light leaking in from somewhere else will also interfere with the photon and kind of essentially wash out the sharp features of it, right? If it's, a, if it's a little bit of noise, you'll still see the features, but if there's a lot of noise, it'll get washed out. Yeah. Is the cosmic background radiation a factor in the two-slit experiment? Not unless you're doing it with microwaves, right? Because the, the cosmic microwave uh, background is a, is a, is a you know, source that's all around us at a very low temperature um, at microwave wavelength scales. So if, if you're doing things at a very different wavelength, then they don't have to worry about the microwave wavelength scales. It, it, yeah. yeah. This is something to do with what you can done the slit experiment and talk about. So this article says that to calculate where a photon would hit the screen, uh, you would use something called the Born rule. But they don't define what that is. You know what that is? If I recall correctly, I think the Born rule is just related to this probabilistic interpretation of the wave function. Is that a formula or something? It's just the idea that if I want to ask the probability of where I'll find the particles related to the magnitude of the wave function at that point, okay. I think. Well, well, they said that the Born rule was found experimentally. They can't derive it for a big sense. Why it's there? It's just there and it works. But, the other, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is they don't know that the Born rule deviates in reality because they said the path of any photon or electron to the screen can take an infinite number, or well not infinite, but a very large number of different paths. Even one, if you have a light source here in the screen here, one path would be from here to the moon. To sure. get the back and get the yeah. screen. But the important point is that they now say that technically each path can have an effect on the other paths. And that a bottom line experiment will eventually show a discrepancy against the pure Born rule calculation of where that electron or or so I don't I don't think that's right because when you do the calculation you do essentially I mean, th this argument about saying that you know the particles can go everywhere is basically the statement that the particle is a quantum wave object it's not just a classical particle and so you know when I assume it's a wave then that wave doesn't vanish strictly anywhere, it has some exponential tail, and then you do the calculation, you include that exponential tail. So if you then just go through the probabilistic interpretation, you're not neglecting those paths. The actual, I mean, you, there's a sense in which you can neglect them because their effect is so small that the scale at which you are measuring locations of photons is coarse-grained enough that the effects of including those very, very far up paths is negligible. You can't physically measure it. And if you can't physically measure it, then sure, you're allowed to ignore it. Now, there, of course, is always going to be you know, some short distance cutoff to how well I can measure the location of a photon. And so that, you know, you, in, unless you have some magic way of doing that in kind of arbitrarily perfect precision, I doubt you're going to actually discredit the probabilistic interpretation. Well, because the bottom line of this whole article is that they believe different paths do significantly interfere with the final result. And that, that eventually they'll be able to measure it. And this will point to uh, uh, the uh, gravity, right? the explanation of gravity. That doesn't sound right, but okay. we, we can discuss it further out. Yeah, okay. Yeah.
Sorry, which, which slide? Uh, we showed where IBM could attack her. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other institutions could attack her of a larger number. Yeah. So my, my question is, is that based on time? If IBM had more time to attack her, they had last that 56,000, would they get that because they had more time? No, so, so, so this isn't an issue of running the computer for a long amount of time. Because as I mentioned, most of this, okay, so this was actually done using NMR qubits, which, so there's a different type of qubit that exists where you basically say, instead of talking about individual electrons, I have some, you know, bunch of molecules, and even molecules themselves can have magnetic moments, and I use magnetic moments of those molecules as, a, as a, a, the total magnetic moment of a set of molecules as a single qubit. So that, that's how they did that. But again, in all of these systems, there's a time scale that you can run the program for before you get this quantum decoherence. And that time scale is, is, say, at best, hundreds of microseconds. So it really, the improvement is just engineering improvements, right? They built cleaner systems that can run for a little bit longer. They're, you know, they're able to add more qubits. They come up with cl more clever algorithms. So I think these, this first, this first calculation was very explicitly, as their title says, using Shor's quantum factorization algorithm to do this. And so the nuclear magnetic resonance is what NMR stands for. Um, these other guys, I think, were using slightly different algorithms that work a little better for different types of quantum computers. Um, but th th these improvements basically come from two different things. It comes from kind of material science improvements, being able to build kind of more stable and, and more robust quantum circuits, and from improvements in the algorithm theory. But it's, not, it's never an issue of running the program for longer, because you really can only run it so long. And so Shor's algorithm is a set of something like six steps. And so if your circuit is set up to go through those six steps and spit out an answer, and hopefully on, you know, on the first or second or third try, you spit out the correct answer, then you're done. So it's not something you have to run forever. That, that's the sense in which it's very different from classical factorization. In classical factorization, it's always a question of time, because you just have to keep trying to multiply different numbers until you hit upon the correct answer. So my understanding that uh, the, the current technology for PCs, we use silicon on the chip. So when you try to use this quantum uh, methodology, are you saying that the, uh, uh, the material has to Yes. Yeah, so, so, if you, if, so, so for instance, a superconducting qubit is some clever thing where you take you take a superconducting droplet and you build a Josephson junction, and it. it's something that's you know much much larger than the kind of individual the, the, than the than the size scale of kind of a modern uh, CPU, right? It's it's something that's oh uh, let's try to guess. You know, these things are probably orders of maybe. Mill, you know, each qubit is probably at best maybe you know, like a millimeter ish or something like that, right? Maybe even bigger. And so, uh, it, it, it's a very it's it's there's a sense which is very different from classical computing. It's not something that you can just turn on and leave on and have it run. You know, like you can have your laptop sitting there running forever, right? It's something that you kind of have to design to do a calculation that you want it to do. Turn it on, have it go through the calculation and give you an answer before the system loses its quantum. Weather. It takes a lot of processing power to calculate a forecast, a weather forecast. Yeah. So I go, oh, okay, so there's probably a, a good uh, utility of trying to develop a quantum computer if you take if you need those type of um, calculations inside. So th that's a doing things like trying to predict the weather is a is a very different type of calculation than say factoring a number or. Uh, searching a database, right? Those are things that quantum computers are very good at. Trying to trying to follow to, to predict the weather involves you kind of have to know what the temperature is everywhere, what direction the wind blow is blowing everywhere, and then plug that into Euler's equation and try to evolve it. So it's not immediately obvious to me that quantum parallelism would help in that case. Um, that doesn't mean it can't help. It's just 
it's not as obvious, right, as it is in the, the idea of factoring numbers, right, if you can take all numbers and multiply them all together at the same time, it's clear that that cuts down the problem of searching through each individual one. There, you really kind of have to take kind of each individual chunk of air and ask how it moves in time and how they bounce off of each other. Um, I'm, I'm sure a clever person can come up with a way to use quantum computing to make that work faster, um, but I don't think they would come up with a way that would make it useful in the immediate future. Yeah. Back to your research. Yeah. So you're saying that on the topological material, they have not created a gate yet? Still they're, they're, they're trying to. So there is experimental work of kind of trying to gently push the system in such a way that if I have two quasi holes, one will slowly drift around the other. Um, but you know, really, so that would be the idea of a quantum gate, right? Because exchanging two of them acts as a quantum gate. So they're not at the level where they can easily just build those the way they can for other qubit like systems. Um, there's no way of making a defect deliberately, you know, kind of creating one rather than hoping one happens naturally as a material? Not obviously. I mean, the, the easiest way to do it would be to pull out an electron, and then that electron hole splits into a bunch of quasi holes. Um, but even that's very difficult. Uh, yeah. It's, it, 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 it's hard, right? I mean, that's, that's the reason that. You know, while it's a very nice story to be able to talk about these lovely, topologically safe, protected objects, you know, you have to put them in there and you have to do things to them without destroying the quantum nature of the system. And that's, that's really kind of the, the, the kind of experimental uh, difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. So on the graph, why is the state of one third represented uh, <coughs> here? And do you say a little bit more about why the five over two state is so promising? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Okay. So, so yes. Yeah. So, so this is this is a zoom in on a very particular reason. So here there isn't even a one third state because so it's cut off here. But this is sorry. This is the two plateau. Yes. This is the three plateau. So way over here would be the one plateau, and then the one third plateau is way up there. So we're zooming in on this particular region, um, and. So, so, so indeed, there's this very funny state, and you'll notice that some, something that should stand out uh, is that five halves is one of almost all of these other fractions are fractions where the denominator is off. Right? There are a couple ones where it's not. Right? Eleven quarters uh, is, is one where it isn't. Uh, nine quarters, and those those are other very special states. Um, basically, the idea is that so. In the story I talked about last week, where I just have a simple quasi-hole in the Laughlin one-third or one-fifth state, when I take quasi-particles around each other, I just get overall phases, right? And it turns out that if that's all I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to braid quasi-holes around each other and just pick up these phases, that isn't enough to build a generic quantum circuit. There are there are circuits like the I, I think the control knot gate, for instance. So. I'm not particularly certain. Like there are some gates like a control knot gate that you can't actually build. If all I have are those uh, one third, any, uh, those one third quasi holes that are braided around each other, it, there's, there's kind of not enough room in there. Um, the, the conjecture is that states like five halves are much, much stranger. And that if I have two quasi holes, so I have quasi hole A and quasi hole A, or right, A and B, and I braid A around B, I don't get back A with a phase. I get that back some linear superpositions of different holes. And it's being able to get construct that linear superposition like it was important in our quantum computing. That's really crucial to be able to construct uh, kind of robust quantum circuitry. So that's that, that idea of braiding A around B and not just getting A times a phase, but getting a linear superpositions of different types of quasi-holes is what's called non-abelian statistics. And you really need non-abelian statistics from braiding quasi-particles to be able to construct kind of generic quantum circuits. Um, and, and five half, so people believe that the five half state should have these non-abelian quasi holes, these non-abelian statistics having quasi holes, um, but it's not actually even fully experimentally verified. Uh, there are people working very hard, but it's a very, very difficult question, right? It's, this delicate interferometry question with objects that are very hard to kind of move around on them.
Yeah. Uh, would you be able to explain what non-abelian statistics are? Sure. I mean, it's 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 so yeah. So the, the idea is basically the following, right? I have some state particle A and particle B, and I say exchange them. If that's abelian, so let's say I wind one around the other. So here I'm exchanging them. Imagine I did a full 360 rotation of one around the other, right? That if that state that I get at the end of the day is just a phase times the state I started with. That's what's called a beam. If instead, the output state is not a phase times the input state, but is a linear superposition of different quasi-whole pairs, that is called a non-abelian statistics. Abelian versus non-abelian is, is, is mathematical link. But the, the idea is basically, I, I want to be able to construct linear superpositions of different types of topological defects just by grading. Because, as, as, as we said previously, you know, it was uh, extremely crucial when we're trying to do good quantum computing to be able to construct these kind of super, super uh, entangled states. So if all I can do is I can act on these guys to get an overall phase sitting out in front, I, can never get, I never get this process of sending 0 to 0 plus 1. That's the key ingredient that I'm missing if I only have abelian statistics. But you have it if you have non abelian statistics. Yeah? Uh, just a quick game from the field. Could you, I wonder if you could tell us if there's a company out there who is out at the front in terms of, I guess, designing, creating topological metaphysics or something like that? Do you mean companies that are working on quantum computing or just more general topological phases of math? Uh, in quantum computing, no. And, and secondly, on bits. Uh, University of Maryland is a very good group working on this. Um, I'm sure, surely other places, you know, I'm sure yeah. places like MIT, Princeton, Cal Oxford, Caltech are all working on these things. You know, and, you know, and it's often people working together. But you know, in any place where they have enough money, to, get, to build a really clean lab. Yeah. And then finally, I mean, you said something over the end of the today's lecture about the issue of stability. Yeah. Uh, what do you see down the line? Um, I think that I think that in the foreseeable future, stability is going to come from engineering improvements in uh, in superconducting qubits, right? Being able to build, you know, slightly more and slightly more and slightly more stable. Superconducting qubits is going to be kind of in the, in the near future. There are also ways of trying to put topologically protected systems into superconductors. So something that I haven't talked about at all, but I can just say a few words about it the following, right? If you have a superconductor, uh, the usual story is that a superconductor expels magnetic fields, right? You try to put a magnetic field in it, and it gets pushed out. That's the reason that if you take a magnet and you put it over a superconductor, it covers, right? Because the magnetic field lines are literally pushed out of the, of the superconducting uh, material. Now, that's true for something that's called a type 1 superconductor. There's a different type of two superconductor called a type 2 superconductor, where a magnetic field can't really permeate the whole object, but it can get pinned in little vortices. You know, a few field lines get trapped and go through a single point of the superconductor. Okay? If that happens for certain types of superconductors, then it turns out that on those kind of magnetic vortices stuck in the superconductor, you can have topologically protected excitations on those vortices. So another very interesting uh, area of research that I'll hopefully talk about in my last lecture are uh, vortices and superconductors and you know, you know, bound states to those vortices. And, you know, with you know the goal, the goal in a lot of this research is basically twofold. One is that as a physicist, it's very interesting to study novel and new states of matter that we don't understand. And two, anytime we have kind of non-trivial quantum states of matter, there's a hope that it'll help us build better quantum computers. Right. So, yeah. I think I believe the answer to my question might be that there's a I'm an alumni of Poly University. I have a you know, IT background and all that. 
And you know, I go there, you know, they, they really kind of push, we're NSA certified and so forth. And those people, you know, you know it's still like children at times. You know, they say, oh, we can, we can do this, we can crack this, we can crack this. And I go, well, don't you have any concerns about privacy or, you know, big brother and all that? And they just look at me as, you know, I'm old fogey. So, so at, 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 uh, and I'm sure any type of science application can be conceived, but does this have any intrinsic risk? Or if there wasn't, if there wasn't this notion of quantum encryption, then I think yes, you could make an argument. But the nice thing about this this whole story is that, along with, of course, having a way to, in theory, you know, we're we're not there yet. Um, but we will get there eventually. You know, how, how long it'll take to get there depends on how well science is funded. That's a different question. Um, but, uh, but because there is this, you know, once you have quantum computers, it's not just that you can factor numbers faster. It's that you can invent wholly new and much, much more uh, robust ways of encrypting information. So, you know, of course, you know, in let, let's assume things go along nicely in you know, some number of decades when this is you know, no longer an issue and you can't just sacrifice these things, we will be able to have quantum encryption lines. I mean, they've been demonstrated to work well uh, experimentally. And because it's, a, because it's, again, based on quantum mechanics, it's far, far, far more robust to intrusion than uh, regular encryption methods. But you know, at, at the end of the day, when you know when, when someone is getting hacked, it's not because someone brute forces something. It's that they you know trick trick some guy to give them their password. So if if you're really concerned about security, you should make sure that everyone enforces kind of good online security practices. Don't worry about whether or not someone's going to break their RSA key for now.